Hi there, I'm Jen. This is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a wrap-up of some of my recent reading. Minus the booktube prize stuff, I'm reading in the nonfiction category, and that has been dominating most of my reading, which is the reason I haven't put out a video in a while, because I can't talk about those until the end of this round. All right, but on to the other stuff. I was gonna say I'm going to go in order from least to most depressing, but since the least depressing thing I read is a book about depression, I don't know if I should say that this time, but I guess I just did. So the lightest thing that I read, more or less, was Debbie Tung's Everything is Okay. This is a collection of comic strips, all of her books are collections of comic strips, and it is basically a chronicle of her having a depressive episode or dealing with clinical depression and getting help and things being okay in the end, more or less. Debbie Tung's comics are always ones that I think you can go to for something light, pretty brainless, but kind of amusing. She writes a lot of collections that are they're four panel single page comic strips most of the time. Her other books have been about things like introversion, book loving, and she has one that's about developing long-term relationships, a kind of romantic book. And all of them are a bit autobiographical, but this one is the most memoir-esque, whereas the other ones do feel like four panels and a punchline. This is still basically single panel comics, but it is there is much more of a through theme carrying through it, and it does feel a little bit more chronological. Although I have seen some people complain that it is too repetitive to be a proper graphic memoir, um, but I think it's closer to being a traditional memoir than any of her other work is, because those are very four panels punchline. Whereas this is one page is self-contained, but there does feel like more connection going through it. I think if you're familiar with her, her work, you might be interested in this as kind of a side thing. If you have read one or two of her things before and you thought they were too fluffy, this is slightly less fluffy, in part because there are fewer strict four panels final punchline. But again, be aware it is comic strips collected still. While it's more of a through story, it's still not strictly speaking a through story. I was entertained. Um, if you're familiar with the author, you know what you're gonna get, basically. Next up, I read a collection of Mahmoud Darvish's poetry. This is Why Did You Leave the Horse Alone, which is translated by Jeffrey Sachs, who I'm gonna say I think is probably my second favorite translator I've read for Darvish, um, after Sina Antoon, who's my favorite. And Sachs actually, actually says in his translator's notes that he ran some of this past Sina Antoon, which I think that's kind of fun. Unlike most of the other, or at least the ones that I've picked up, of Darvish's work that Archipelago Press has put up. This does have both the original and the translation, which I always think is the way poetry translations should be published, because even if you don't can't read the original at all, uh, it gives you something uh, something of a sense of how the words lay on the page. And, and if you have a little bit of fluency, but not enough to actually read and comprehend the poetry, it still gives you something to look back and forth to see what the translator's doing if you do speak a little bit. So I really appreciate that about this particular edition. Yeah, I wish they did more of that when uh, Archipelago Press was putting out translated poetry, because so much of their catalog is poetry and translation, and I don't know why more of them aren't like this, because this is the first one I've seen from them that is done that way. So if you're watching this and you know of more, let me know, because that's something I'd be interested to see. As always with Darvish, there is a lot of contemplation about home and exile, and the movement of history. As with a lot of Darvish's poetry, this is dealing a lot with uh, tides of history and with home and home and exile and being in part of the world where a lot of the dramatic moments of history have happened and continue to happen. With this kind of thing, I think it's kind of silly to try to review or discuss it without sharing some, so I'm going to read part of A Cloud in My Hand. The place was ready for his birth, a hill of his ancestor's basil that looks east and west. An olive tree near another in the holy books lifts the surfaces of language. Azure smoke prepares the day for an affair that concerns only God. March is the pampered child of months. It combs cotton from the almond tree. It gives a banquet of mallow to the church courtyard. March is a land in the swallow's night. And for a woman preparing for her scream in the wilderness, stretching across the oak tree, a child is born, his scream in the cracks of the place. We parted at the steps of the house. They said, in my scream, there's a caution that doesn't suit the abandon of the plants. In my scream, there's ruin. Did I wrong my brothers when I said I saw angels playing with the wolf in the courtyard? I don't remember their names, and I don't remember the way they spoke or the way they lightly flew. 
My friends shimmer like the night without leaving a trace behind them. Should I tell my mother the truth? I have other brothers, brothers who put a moon on my balcony, brothers who weave with their needles a coat of daisies. They saddled the horses, but they didn't know why. But they saddled the horses at the end of night, and so on. I think if you've never read anything from Darvish, this is a fantastic place to start. Although I would still say that my favorite from him is In the Presence of Absence. Let's have a novel in the middle of this, shall we? Next up I read Nesla Koja's The I Applicant. I recorded this four times now because I start ranting about this book. So this is a book within a book. We meet this main character, Leila. She's a Turkish grad student in Berlin, but she's just had her thesis idea rejected, so she's been kicked out of grad school, which means that there is a limit on how long she can stay because her visa is tied to being a student. In terms of the book within a book, we learn that she is trying to publish her journal, and the journal is what we're reading, and she talks about that. So you're kind of invited to think it's autofiction, but the character has a different name than the author, so it's clearly not really, but you are being invited to think about the, the reality versus what's what's real and what's fiction. If you saw what I said about this on Instagram, you'll know I didn't like this, but I don't think it's a quality issue. This is compellingly written, it reads quickly, and I think if you're a big fan of the artist having quarter-life crisis in Berlin subgenre, I think you will like this a lot. I didn't like this primarily because the author slash character is regularly presenting immigrant issues and also attitudes towards the rest of the Turkish diaspora in Germany from a really negative and self-centered kind of view. And I found that really frustrating <laughs> because I think a lot of people are going to read this book, which is, you know, written in English for an Anglophone audience. And a lot of people who haven't thought about immigrant issues and who don't even know about the, like the demographics of Germany are going to take some of this at face value and that frustrates me. But before I get into that, I will say I've seen a bunch of reviews about this where they talk about it being her considering, the main character considering a marriage of convenience with her Swedish boyfriend. The Swedish guy doesn't show up until 60% of the book. So I wouldn't say that it's centrally about that. I think that kind of colors the final quarter, but uh, I wouldn't say that that's the main theme here. I think centrally, this is a quarter life crisis in Berlin artist book. And if there's a secondary thing that's going through it, it's grief because the main character has lost her father shortly before she moved. And her ability to grieve for him was kind of initially colored by the fact that he did something that caused her family a lot of financial problems. And so she was dealing with that at the same time that she lost him. So those, I think, are more centrally what's going on. But it, it is all filtered through the kind of urgency of the visa problems, but not in the way that I would have expected based on the reviews I'd seen that focused on the visa stuff. One of the things that gets talked about when it comes to the visa things is that there's a lot of ruminating on having a less powerful passport in a country where most of the people have a more powerful one. But the issue that I had with that is that she will regularly refer to herself as being at the bottom of the immigrant barrel. And she's somebody who went to American styles, private schools. So she speaks Turkish and English. Now, if you're going to go to Germany and not speak German, those are the two best languages to speak. People will, you know, you can live your whole life, especially in Berlin, without speaking German if you speak English and Turkish. That's, those are the languages to speak. Um, she also talks about how when people meet her and uh, are speaking English with her, they don't clock her as being specifically Turkish. They as always assume she's American. And so the frustration of her calling herself bottom of the barrel when she's middle of the barrel is, you do think, have you never met anyone from, say, Central African Republic who isn't going, speak, who, whose passport is even weaker and doesn't speak the two other most spoken languages in Germany, right? But she doesn't think about that because this character, she's young, but she's not that young. She's in her late 20s. She doesn't need to be as self-centered as she is. And some of that, again, is because her both her family had this financial crisis, but also the Turkish lira is has plummeted. And this is set a few years ago, so it's even worse now. And so her frustration about that is real and is genuine and is something that people who don't spend a lot of time living in other countries who have never had to think about, oh, is my currency about to be devalued and what is that gonna, what kind of impact is that gonna have on me? It could be eye-opening that way, but it is still frustrating because the character is so classist in other ways. 
like when she meets the kind of like the, an older generation of Turkish immigrants in Germany and she's meeting working class guys who have been there 30 years so you know younger than the guest workers generation but sort of in between and a lot of those people do have really regressive politics and they have dual citizenship so they're voting for stuff in Turkish elections that they won't have to listen live with because they're in Germany but and there's a lot of that and that is fair but she doesn't explore or she doesn't even care how those people got that way and I found that really frustrating it's also kind of noticeable the only like German Turk that she meets is just somebody that they despise and fairly because in story he gets her friend fired but at a global level she's in Berlin how is this the only German Turk that you meet right <laughs> like um, and that he's somebody that she despises the the I found that really frustrating because it's also this is a book where we, there's all kinds of cultural references to everything from high culture low culture opera plays soap operas the whole thing but within that they're all German references or Turkish references or English American references but never Turkish German references maybe the one point where she said she never got into Deutsch rap maybe that's the the side thing but it does feel like there's a whole you know wealth of culture that exists that you are that she it feels very intentionally ignored and it feels like a class thing like the only thing she references that even comes close to that is Sabahattin Ali's Madonna in a fur coat and it feels like almost that she had to because that's a journal her this book is a journal but even though the author and character in this uh, speak German they went back and it feels like if they hadn't gone back that wouldn't even be a reference and that feels weird to me like it feels intentional in a way that is really negative I think personally now if you don't have the hang-ups that I do which I feel like most people don't you will enjoy this a million times more than I did so take all of that with a grain of salt my personal hang-ups on that you know are what they are all right next up I read Sylvia Malloy's Dislocations, which is translated by Jennifer Croft. This is marketed and labeled in such a way that you'd think it was a novel, but it's actually, I wouldn't even say it's autofiction, it feels like a journal in itself. And this is about the main character slash the author watching one of her friends who is in a nursing home with dementia, losing her memories and thinking about what that means for her as somebody who's been friends with this person for who knows, 50, 50 years or more. And what does it mean when the last person who witnessed various parts of your life has lost their memory? And how there is no longer anyone who is tied to those things. You could make up stories about what happened in the past because there's no one left who can contradict you. And it, it's also looking a bit at just uh, how odd memory loss can be because there is one point, both of these people are in the US and are Argentinian and there is one point where the the woman with dementia is able to translate between English and Spanish things that she doesn't understand and can't produce on her own so she'll be translating for the nurse about uh, and without realizing that the symptoms she's listing are her symptoms and things like that so it is really interesting it's a very short book at a kind of external level it's very odd to me that this is the first thing of Sylvia Malloy's that's been translated into English because Malloy is known broadly and internationally for basically two things for being basically a trailblazer of Argentinian queer writing and then also for being for having really interesting thoughts on multilingualism and language mixing and whatnot because she's Argentine but her father was Irish and her mother was French and she grew up with Spanish French and English uh, natively and so a lot of her writing on it on language and so it's weird that this is the first thing that was translated as opposed to any of her writing that is centrally about language or that is the trailblazing lesbian stuff so really interesting really again it's, it's short so I don't know that I can say that much about it but I think a really fantastic look at memory and what other people's memory loss what kind of impact that has on people and also the interaction of language and memory and uh, things that people say by rote and 
does that feel different hearing that from someone who when you know there isn't anything else behind it versus when it's someone who does have their memory intact and is just filling time and things so yeah really interesting stuff next up i read a sports memoir of sorts this is oksana masters the hard parts she is a para biathlete you know i love cross-country skiing and biathlon but what makes this book particularly interesting is that uh, masters is kind of aware that other uh, Paralympic athletes have oh has had their life stories turned into something that's basically inspiration porn or that will make other people look at them and think about the worst things in their lives and she doesn't want to do that but at the same time she has this desire to to say to you know the five-year-old or ten-year-old version of herself that uh, things are okay and other people like you exist and have lived through the same kind of things exist and so that kind of carries through the whole and I think that's really interesting and is something that I'd love to see more of in both sports memoirs and specifically parasports memoirs because I think a lot of them fall into that kind of inspiration porn kind of thing and so the awareness of that is really interesting so Masters was born basically downwind of Chernobyl and had a lot of significant mostly skeletal but also some uh, internal organ deformities and her biological parents sent her to an orphanage which she lived in until she was seven and was like brutally physically and sexually abused and saw other people beaten to death and was just generally horrible and was eventually adopted by an American which is why she competes for the US uh, eventually got into first rowing and then later cross-country skiing and biathlon um, and had an abusive relationship in the middle and the book goes more or less chronologically which is fine uh, the, the one weakness I think is that it ends at a very odd point because because I'm aware of who she is I don't really follow the sitting classes in in parabiathlon to the same extent that I follow the standing classes but because I follow other people I often get her posts or her fiance's posts because he's also in the same sport on the you know kind of recommended page on Instagram so I'm aware of stuff in their lives and it ends weirdly early like this came out this year so it was written last year and it feels like it ends at a point both sport wise and in terms of personal stuff wise like it ends where there could have been more she kind of famously won a gold medal after having broken her elbow which you can imagine sit skiing that's pretty significant um, but she ends it there so I think if you weren't aware of her career in general you'd be like well so then what happened and there's none of that and she does have some kind of build some build up relationship wise to her relationship with her boyfriend in the book but fiance now and it I would have expected that to end when they got engaged but it doesn't so that's slightly weird there is also I think a, t a, tr a trend in adoptee stories where you expect the person to to either come to terms with never being able to find their biological family or to meet them and in her case she's had some contact with someone who's probably her biological brother but she hasn't wanted to meet them and now because of the war in Ukraine that becomes you know maybe impossible and so there isn't really a resolution that way which I think is is normal for somebody's real life but when you're reading a memoir that's structured in a certain way it does become you do kind of sit back and say oh <laughs> it feels like we're missing a certain climax but regardless of that I think it was a good read it is as I said rough because you are going through all of this childhood abuse with her and then kind of her trying to work her way through having PTSD as a result of that and so that is kind of rough in a way that I think a lot of people might not want when they're going for something that inspirational uh, might be one of the selling features but I, I think if you are into to sports memoirs if you're curious about um, an adoptee memoir that doesn't hit those two points that I think we've come to expect I do think it's worth reading for that and finally the sewing circles of Herat this is by Christina Lamb and this was written 20 years ago so in some ways it feels, feels like an interesting point in time but given everything that's happened in Afghanistan since then it does feel like there's something missing but that is not the fault of the book because it was written 20 years ago so uh, you can't blame her for not knowing what was going to happen in between 
So Lam had been a journalist in Afghanistan in the late 80s during the last days of the Russian war there. And in the early 2000s, she goes back and meets a lot of the people that she knew then, or meets people that knew people who had been killed in the interim. And it is a really interesting portrait of that time because this is just when the US invasion had started. And the attitudes towards what was going to happen for the future and what was going to be good or bad or, you know, where the politics were going to go and, and the Taliban had just been removed from some areas where they're obviously back now. Um, and so there is, in some parts, hopefulness that obviously wasn't called for given everything that happened afterwards, but it's still an interesting portrait of the moment. And I think it's just hard to focus on that when so when we're just so aware of everything that's happened in between. So it's a tough one because occasionally like Lamb will meet with someone and they'll tell her one thing and her interpretation is, oh, well, I think there's some doubt in his eyes. And I just thought that's not responsible journalism. Doubt in his eyes is nothing. Like, Give me some research. So there are bits and pieces of that that I found a bit frustrating, but overall I think this is interesting. It is wildly depressing in terms of how much worse things have gotten since then. And I don't know, it just you think about what would people have been thinking in 2002 when they didn't realize how long was the US going to be there? What was going to happen with the Taliban after they left? It would have been a great book to read 20 years ago. That's, that's the best thing that I can say about that. Although, you know, having said that, I think what would actually be the best context to read this in is the the early sections where she's talking about people she met in the 80s and uh, being embedded with certain freedom fighters who were against the Russians in those days. I think it would be an interesting pairing with uh, Svetlana Alexievich's Zinky Boys or Boys and Zinc, the translations of that have two different names, which is an oral history of Russian soldiers who were in Afghanistan in the 80s. And I think that pairing would be really interesting because it would force you to focus on that as opposed to um, reading about the early 2000s stuff and thinking about everything that's happened in between makes it feel more current and obviously this was current when it was published 20 years ago but um, I think yeah if you were focused more on the 1980s stuff I think it would be more readable on its own as opposed to always being out here and wanting to google yeah what happened to that person in between or what happened in that city in between uh, because despite the title it's not specifically about Herat. He's, she's going to a bunch of different places and talking to people who are uh, outside of the country as well and everything. And, um, but yeah, worth reading, but I think worth reading keeping the context of when it was written and all of that uh, in mind. All right, in any case, if you've read any of these, I'd love to hear what you thought. Uh, if you read The Applicant and loved it, that's fair. <laughs> um, Anyway, that's it for now. Ciao.